I was born in Akron, Ohio. And when I went away to college in 1970 to New York City, I got so tired of people mispronouncing the name of my hometown. They would say things like acorn, <laughs> sometimes just to get on my nerves. And so I started saying I'm from a city near Cleveland. In 1976, I moved back here to Northeast Ohio and taught at Shaker Heights High School for four years before I decided I wanted to move on to higher education. In 1987, I earned a PhD in English from Case Western Reserve University, studying Toni Morrison and other American writers and doing one of the first cross-cultural studies on Toni Morrison. I later moved on after working as a professor to become an associate provost, and then I was uh, provost at a historically black college for women in Greensboro, North Carolina. Shortly after that, President Barbara Snyder gave me the opportunity to be the first vice president for inclusion, diversity, and equal opportunity here at Case Western Reserve University. I was excited about coming back home and glad to be back here because I had already been reading the alumni information and had been learning how wonderful a job she was doing. I also appreciated the fact that she understood that diversity leadership starts at the top. Diversity is a core value in our university um, documents and mission statement, and we were putting that into action by selecting someone to head that office. We have been doing amazing things at Case Western Reserve University, not the least of which this past year we brought in our largest, most diverse, most academically accomplished class. We have a diversity strategic action plan, and we are in the process of internationalizing our campus and putting more focus on internationalization than ever before. Our faculty, students, and staff are doing amazing things, and our alumni are working in this city, in this region, in the nation, and around the world. I'm also happy to be back in Cleveland because I know the city's history. You can't live as close as Akron and not know all about this city. It has a wonderful, amazing history. It has amazing people. It has amazing cultural institutions, educational institutions. And when I came back here, I was amazed that our students were doing internships, service learning projects all over the city, very engaged in the city. We just heard the mayor say at his State of the City address that this city could go either direction. It is yet again poised for greatness. I believe that, and many other people believe that. At the same time, it could go either way, as the mayor said. And I believe one of the reasons it could go either way is how we deal with diversity. This is a very diverse city. We know um, that there are diverse ethnic neighborhoods, traditions here. And we also know that people are waiting and hoping to be included in all the good prosperity that is yet to come and that we are experiencing right now. So I want to talk for a few minutes about diversity in some other ways. On one hand, there are people who say, well, there's a lot of diversity stuff going on. It's going on at Case Western. It's going on in the city. I just came back from the National Association of Diversity Officers in Higher Education, where those of us who are chief diversity officers get together. We belong at Case Western Reserve University to the Greater Cleveland Partnership. The Commission on Economic Inclusion has celebrated us for our work. We've gotten national awards already for our work in diversity. And there are some people that says there's a lot going on. We're done already. There are some people who have even had the nerve to say we are in a post-racial society because President Barack Obama is the president. And then there are some people who say, we have only begun to do the diversity work that needs to be done. We are not there yet. I refer to diversity as the nation's unfinished business. I believe in celebrating what has happened that is positive, and I believe in telling the truth about the work yet to do. So if you'll indulge me, we're going to have a conversation about diversity. I'd like to begin by sharing some quotations that I really believe help set the context for a dialogue on diversity. One is by W.B. Du Bois, who many of you know was one of the founders of the NAACP. And in 1903, in his book, Souls of Black Folk, he said, we want to be co-workers in the kingdom of culture. If you've been part of a marginalized group, whether by race or ethnicity or sexuality or religion 
or age or disability or veteran status, you know you want to be a coworker in the kingdom of culture. You don't want to be on the margins. You want to be included. My second quotation comes from Bell Hooks. Whenever I teach, I know I stand at the intersection of race, gender, and class in the classroom. And as somebody who did a cross-cultural study on Toni Morrison, I was always aware when I was teaching literature that I was standing in the classroom, as Bell Hooks says, as the radical space of possibility. All kinds of things can happen in the classroom if you are willing to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with your students and recognize that the learning is going to happen both ways. And finally, I'm a Toni Morrison scholar, so I'm going to quote Toni Morrison. Anybody knows me, I will quote her. And so Toni Morrison says in her Nobel lecture that narrative is radical, creating us at the very moment it is being created. So I want to share for a few minutes how could we be in this situation where people say enough already with diversity. I've had it up to here. And other people are saying we need more diversity. We need to pay attention not just to diversity, but to diversity and inclusion. When you have that kind of a situation, you have a paradox, something that has contradiction built into it. I like to talk about what social scientist Marilyn Lowden calls the diversity wheel. Um, she refers to it as a diversity wheel, and it talks about all of the multiple identities that we all share, that we all have. She talks about race and gender and sexual orientation and age. You see that in the circle. There's also other elements of our identity, like religion, our education, um, our geographical location. And then there are our organizations, where we're, org where we're located in the organizations in which we work, in which we worship, in which we lead, whatever our roles are, what our status is in those organizations. And so all of these help us think about diversity. I refer to this as a cultural contact lens. We are always reading, whether we're reading a text, whether we're reading the internet, a movie, whether we're reading this audience, whether we're reading Cleveland, this region, the nation, or whether we're reading the global text of the communities that we all live in. So I want to talk for a few minutes about how this paradox shows up. And I want to begin by telling you a few stories. I'm a storyteller also. So um, this first story is about teaching my favorite Toni Morrison short story. The short story is called Recitative. It's about these two eight-year-old girls who end up in an orphanage, not because they are actually orphans, but because their mothers have been deemed unfit by the state. And so these two girls are in the room together. And we hear the thoughts of one girl. She says, my mother would have a fit if she knew I were sharing a room with someone of your race. My mother believes your race smells funny and your hair smells funny. So we watch these two girls go through school, uh, go through the orphanage life, rather, and we watch them become mothers. At one point, they're on either side of a 1950s desegregation march. Later, we meet them, and one has um, become fairly well off, and the other works at a Howard Johnson's. And they're having a conversation, and they look at each other, and they say, was Maggie pushed, or did she fall? As adult women, years later, they're remembering when they were in the orphanage, the disabled woman, who was deaf and mute, ended up on the floor. And they simply laughed with the other girls. So as adult women, they look at each other, and they're trying to remember what happened. Whenever I teach this story, I love the way my students have at it. They try to figure out which girl was black and which girl was white. And the class discussion is always back and forth. They believe they are taking clues out of the story to decide which girl is black and which one is white. So I love the fact that one year when I was teaching this story, a white gentleman raised his hand and said, Dr. Mobley, it is not about which girl is black and which girl is white. It is about the fact that those two girls saw that woman on the floor. They didn't ask her was she hurt. They didn't go help her. They simply laughed with the other girls. I said, thank you, my brother. You are absolutely correct. There is a moral, ethical crisis smack dab in the middle of that story. Thank you for noticing. So that kind of changed the way the lecture started going, and the students started wanting to discuss that part of the story. And they started putting up their bags together at the end of the class, and we're getting ready to go. And this gentleman walks up to me, and he says, Dr. Mobley, I think I figured out which one is black and which one is white. And I said, oh, no, 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 no. I said to the class, everybody, come on back in here. I said, this gentleman has just revealed that he's hung up on the same thing you all are hung up on. 
And therefore, I said, so he doesn't get to take the high road. He was all uh, upset with me. But the, re the reality is, he demonstrated what Morrison was trying to prove when she wrote that story and left out the racial markers that would help us decide. She threw us back as readers on our own devices. And that gentleman was caught up in the same thing. So my first story is designed to say, diversity is our unfinished business because what we cannot acknowledge, we cannot address. If we can't address it, we don't make the progress that we need to make, whether we're talking about a university, a, a, a school, the city, a region, or the country. If we can't acknowledge it, we can't address it. And then I remember that years ago when I was in graduate school, I was about to join a women's organization in Connecticut, and I went to their uh, event, which was a membership tea. At their membership tea, they had a skit about the women's suffrage movement called Buttons and Ballots. So I thought, okay, this is pretty cool. As I watched the skit, I got angrier and angrier. There was no reference to women of color. And so I decided to write them. I said, you know what? I was about to join your organization, but your omission, your exclusion of women of color who were part of the women's suffrage movement has made me change my mind. You could have included Sojourner Truth, you could have included Ida B. Wells. You could have included Mary Church Terrell. You could have included the women of Delta Sigma Theta Incorporated. But since you did not, I'm really not interested. Much to my surprise, the women of that organization wrote me. They said, you're absolutely right. We are going to edit the performance before it goes back on the road. Although I never saw it, I appreciated that that example of my civic engagement did make a difference. They both demonstrated what had actually happened. Often, black women and women of color were excluded from the suffrage movement. That did not deny the fact that they were part of it. And so it exemplifies my next point, and that is that what we cannot acknowledge, we sometimes cannot address, and we have to acknowledge our blind spots. They were doing good gender diversity, but they were completely um, unaware that their racial diversity was damaging the product that they had produced for, our, for stage. And then I remember what it was like to go away to college. I went away to college, as I said a few minutes ago, in 1970. That was the convergence of three movements, the Black Power Movement, the Women's Movement, and the anti-war, anti-Vietnam War movement. And I think my mother had seen so many people go away to college and end up on the 6 o'clock news that when it was time for me to decide where I would live, my offer letter from this very prestigious women's college in New York said that I could either live on the integrated floor, the fifth floor, or I could live on the seventh floor. So trying to be obedient and thinking maybe my mother was right, given who I am as a person, maybe I would have ended up on the 6 o'clock news, I decided to live on the fifth floor. But I felt so alienated, so marginalized, so unincluded and unengaged that I said to my mom the second year, I'm sorry, I'm going up on the black floor. That decision made all the difference in the world. I think it accounts for why I graduated on the dean's list and with honors. It's an example of what corporations even around this city know, and that is that you need affinity groups and employee resource groups often to give people a sense of belonging. Everybody doesn't want them or need them, but it's important to have them to give a sense of belonging, and it encourages a way to be competitive. We have them at the university schools around the country, have them for Asian students, LGBT students, veteran students. I recently recommended one for caregivers at the university. And so it's an example of a best practice in diversity work. I'm in diversity work because I know what I learned from my parents to whom much is given, much is required. And so I'm part of a legacy of diversity work. In 1963, my parents were part of the March on Washington. They left with the Akron chapter of the NAACP for Washington, D.C., where they actually heard Dr. King give the I Have a Dream speech. I remember being in my grandfather's house, watching the monitor, looking for my parents in that big throng of people. But the point is that I learned from them that you have to give back, 
that diversity matters. I believe this city is going to thrive if, as the prosperity goes down the road, that there are people at the table that, that as we look at boards, as we look at senior leadership teams, as we look at decisions, people are included. I think the mayor is right. We could go either way in Cleveland. I'm optimistic that we're on the right path as long as we pay attention to diversity by acknowledging it by valuing it, by looking at our biases, and then being aware that there are best practices if we believe in diversity, we have to act on it. So I'm leaving you with a homework assignment. Think about what your diversity stories are. My three questions for audiences are always, who am I, what is my work, and how will I contribute? That's a question of identity, it's a question of calling, and it's a question of service. It's not enough to say I have friends of a particular group, it's not enough to say I care about something, it is important to act on what we care about. I believe Cleveland is worth it, I believe this region is worth it, and I believe our country and the global community of which we are a part is worth it. Thank you.